Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the ongoing death and killing and the killing of children in Gaza. Froz Sidwa is our guest. He is a trauma surgeon who volunteered for two weeks in March and April at the European Hospital in Khan Yunis, Gaza. He is one of 99 doctors who recently signed an open letter to President Biden and Vice President Harris. It may be more than 99 if they're still signing that estimated Palestinian war deaths in Gaza at no less than 118,908. He is also the author of an October 9th article in the New York Times based on his surveying of 65 healthcare workers documenting, among much else, that Israeli soldiers are regularly shooting children in the heads and in the chest. Froze Sidwa, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks. Nice to be here. Um, it's, it's horrible to talk about, but let's start with shooting children in the head and the chest. Uh, this is, you know, it's remarkable that you got this in the New York Times. It's remarkable that you did this reporting, and it's horrendous that it's happening. It is, yeah, um, yeah. It's it's one of those things where you're like, hmm, how do we start talking about this? Uh, yeah. So you know, the the factual point is that um, everyone in who every Western healthcare worker, doctor, nurse, anybody who's been to Gaza since October seventh has uh, and and has worked in the appropriate setting, you know, as a paramedic, as a as an emergency room doctor, as an ICU doctor, as a pediatrician any of those people, all of them, almost all of them, have regularly seen children who were shot in the head or the chest. Um, and I don't mean 17 and a half year old kids, I mean young, uh, you know, young young children, pre-teenagers we're talking about. And, you know, that, uh, I was, I, you know, when I was there, like you mentioned, I was in, uh, I was in European hospital in Khan Yunus. I was there for two weeks, uh, 13 days of clinical work, and I saw 13 kids shot in the head. So one literally every day. And it's important to remember, I'm not even the person they call when a kid comes in and they've been shot in the head. They call the neurosurgeon. I'm a trauma surgeon. So um, I would happen to find them if I happened to be there, if I happened to be in the emergency room at that point, or if I walked through the IC later and I saw there was a new new kid. So, um, so you know, in my, in my two weeks there, in this one part of Gaza, every single day, uh, a kid was getting shot in the head or and the ch- head and or chest. And in my case, they were all all shot in the head as well. And, you know, when I got home, I, while we were there, I was thinking this must just be the work of some kind of sadistic sniper that's somewhere around the hospital. But when I got home, I went to a, um, uh, a conference. Uh, it was a Doctors Against Genocide conference. So they'd asked me to be on a panel there. And I sat next to a guy named Thayer Ahmed. And uh, he, um, he said, uh, you know, we're just casually talking. He, he, he's an emergency room physician. He's also been over in Gaza. And uh, we were just talking. And one of the things I said was, you know, I couldn't believe how many kids I saw shot in the head. Um, I was expecting him to go, oh, wow, I didn't see that. But he goes, yeah, yeah, me too, I, almost every day. And I was like, whoa, really? Okay, because he was at a different hospital on the other side of Khan Yunus um, at a totally different time than, than I was. So, so now I'm like, okay, there's two people. So I started asking people, you know, I, I, I knew everybody on my trip, what they had already, what they had seen. But so I started reaching out to American physicians um, and nurses and and asking, you know, what did you see? And uh, I was I was surprised that almost everybody saw the same thing. Yeah. And you know, it, it has it's it's important to realize it's not just well another bad thing is happening. You know, it, th- there's this constant claim that Israel is taking all efforts to minimize civilian casualties and all this other nonsense. Um, it's it's pretty clear. You know, you can read any any really any human rights report, any UN report. It's hard to read them and not come away with the impression that Israel is targeting the civilian population of Gaza. That's the the the, the so-called war is not a war on Hamas. It's a war on the, the Palestinians of Gaza, which is also exactly what Israeli leaders have been saying it is. So it, I don't know why it's uh, surprising to people, but the American media does a lot of interference for the Israeli government. Um, and, you know, even in the Israeli media, you can, you can read far more... Uh, far more serious critiques in the Israeli media of what, what Israel's doing in Gaza, um, especially vis-a-vis whether or not it will actually return the, the Israeli hostages to Israel. But 
Yeah, it's very Regardless. strange. It's very strange because Israeli leaders talk about killing as if that's the entire point. And Israeli yeah. soldiers film themselves doing it and put it on dating websites. Uh, it's very open. But much reporting, including in the New York Times, which printed this article of yours, mm -hmm. it's as if the killing were an accidental byproduct of some strategic yeah. operation towards some, uh, you know, arcane military goal. And right. And then that's and that's one of the that's one of the reasons that I've been pointing out as much as I can to anybody who will listen that the shooting the, the widespread systematic shooting of children in Gaza you know if it if if it had gone on for a week after October seventh you could say okay fine emotions were running high it's not not okay it's not good but you could understand where it came from and then if after a week the Israeli military clamped down on it you'd say okay fine those individual soldiers committed war crimes no doubt about that but you wouldn't say it's Israeli policy but it hasn't been going on for a week or a month it's been going on for an entire year that's pretty outrageous I mean yeah that, that's that's extremely unusual uh it, it's very hard to pretend that it's not policy at this point. Like, I seriously doubt that Yoav Gallant wakes up, the, the Israeli defense minister. I doubt he wakes up and gets on the phone and says, okay, make sure 10 kids get shot today. That that strikes me as totally implausible. But uh, but it's, you know, the Israeli military is very sophisticated. They have all sorts of surveillance stuff. They all wear body cameras. They, they know who they're shooting. It's not some, they're not confused about it. And like you said, it's it's quite quite open. Uh, there's, there's, there, there's very little attempt to hide it from the, on the, from the standpoint of the individual soldier, which means they think it's normal, right? I mean, if, if I burn this hotel down that I'm staying in right now, I would try to hide it because I know I'll get in trouble for it. If I didn't think I would get in trouble for it, that's the only time I wouldn't make any attempt to hide it, right? And that's that's kind of obvious. Then you know, I was on, I was on another podcast with um, another uh, another healthcare provider, uh, Monica Johnson. She's a um, uh, mostly a wound care nurse, a wound care NP, if I remember correctly, uh, who's been over there. And she made a she made a good point. She said, you know, if if it was true that the children and the women and the uninvolved men, which is almost everybody, um, if they were collateral damage. Why would you destroy the hospital system? Because you're it, like, if I bomb my neighbor's house and I say, oh, my God, I wasn't aiming for you. I'm so sorry. I, I go to the world. Oh, gosh, I'm so, so sorry. I can't believe that happened. And then somebody sent an ambulance and I said, oh, no, 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 you can't go there. Everyone would say, wait, what do you what do you mean the ambulance can't go there? I said, oh, no, no, the bombing was an accident, but the, there's no ambulances allowed. You can't you're not allowed to take care of that person. Well, but but you bombed them and you're saying it's an accident. Wouldn't you want to rectify that problem by getting them to a healthcare? No, I don't. Well, that that just obviously raises the question, are you sure it was an accident that this guy blew up that guy's house? That's exactly what's going on here. I, again, it's just it's just transparent. I mean, there, there's very little attempt to hide it, like you said. But what it means and then what it what it indicates is that, you know, maybe maybe there's a war against Hamas going on. I don't I'm not honestly sure there is. But what it indicates is that the Israelis just don't conceive of Hamas and the Palestinians as any different. They're, they're just indistinguishable from one another. Um, and so it's it's a war on the civilian population of Gaza. And exactly like you said, that's exactly what it's been called by Israeli leaders from day one. There's very little attempt to hide it. Uh, you know, we're fighting human animals. Uh, you know, do, uh, you know, remember what, um, what's the biblical term? Remember what um, Amalek, uh, remember how we fought Amalek? You know, these are not. You know, but Selim put out a, a statement after Netanyahu said that, saying that anyone, because you know, I'd like, like I'm, I'm a, I'm just a random guy. I'm, I have no religious preference whatsoever. I, I grew up in the U.S. You know, my parents are, are immigrants from from India and Pakistan. But, um, you know, I'm not Muslim. I'm not Jewish. I'm not Palestinian. I'm not Arab. I don't really have any organic connection to this. And I, uh, I've read the Bible, but I don't, you know. I, I don't recite it to be sure. So I, you know, when somebody says Amalek, it doesn't mean anything to me. But when, but but Selim wrote, they said anyone who has gone through the Israeli educational system knows what that means. It means kill every man, woman, child, and even donkey, right? And that's the that's what the biblical story uh, says. The Lord told the people to do. So it's not some uh, it's not some far fledged idea that Israel is just killing everybody in Gaza. You know, they, it's also important to remember how the war started. You know, they said, uh, you know, Gallant said there will be no food, fuel, water, or electricity in Gaza. And the first thing they did was float this idea of trying to get the Palestinians expelled to the Sinai uh, en masse, right? Well, Sisi said no, and the U.S. apparently backed Sisi over, over Israel, which tells you something about who's actually in charge. And so then the Israelis said, okay, fine. 
no food, fuel, water, or electricity. Well, the U.S. said, it, look, it would be embarrassing. I'm assuming the U.S. said this. It would be embarrassing to just starve everyone in Gaza to death. Um, you know, the world isn't going to tolerate that, so you can't do that. So the Israelis said, okay, fine, we'll just make the place uninhabitable because they knew they could get away with it. And I, I also suspect that's like the real, the major uh, 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 motivation behind the just absolutely ridiculous attempt to paint October 7th as what it, as, you know, all sorts of terrible crimes were committed on October 7th, but that wasn't good enough, you know? That wouldn't, that wouldn't justify a gen, or that wouldn't provide cover for a genocidal campaign like they're doing now. Uh, instead, they had to come up with crazed stories about children being cooked in ovens and tied together and burned alive and, but, you know, a woman's breasts were cut off while she was sitting at the breakfast table and then Hamas sat down and ate ate, ate their food. Just, you know, all sorts of just loop, just bizarre, like, you know, trying to make it as if like a group of gorillas came through here, like like not G-U-E-R, but like G-O-R-I-L-L-A-S. Gorillas came through and just, you know, crazed, totally amoral uh, people that happened to have weapons and just just slaughtered a bunch of people for literally no reason other than just what can only be explained as insane anti-Semitism. It's just totally ahistorical nonsense, leaving aside that none of it actually happened. But, you know, it's just, it's it's bizarre. So this whole thing just fits together. Um, and the 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 reason that I brought up the the, the murder, the, the direct killing of children so often um, is not because I like talking about it. I certainly don't. But it is, it, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an inarguable fact that really just undercuts the entire nonsensical narrative that's been built up around uh, what Gaza was on October 6th and what it is now. Well, and all the lies and exaggerations and fictions about October 7th aren't completely random and bizarre if the Israelis were planning to commit those very atrocities against the Palestinians and wanted to be able to say that the Palestinians had done it first, that Hamas had done it first. Um, but th this report in the New York Times, I think, is is very, very powerful because it's not just you or I saying this must mm -hmm. be what Israel's up to, but you've surveyed 65 doctors who've worked in Gaza and documented how many of them, and it's most of them, have seen children shot in the head or chest, have seen children with malnutrition, have seen children with psychiatric distress, have seen babies born and then die, have seen preventable infections, have seen medical necessities unavailable. And you document how many and, and quote a bunch of them uh, on mm -hmm. what they've said here. It's it's hard to, hard to say anything uh, to refute that. I think it's very well done. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, the funny thing, I, I've been talking a lot since I got back from Gaza. Um, and one, you know, people have accused me, oh, you're, you're Hamas, you're whatever, um, you're a Nazi, uh, you know, fine. But the, um, I'm not obviously, but, but well, yeah, I can't stop people from saying it. One thing no one's really accused me of is making it up. Then that's interesting to me because they, I think they just realize it's kind of a non-starter. You know, okay, fine. I'm making it up. You go to Gaza. You're, you know, actually the only that there was some guy from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies or something. I guess some stupid thing. But the um, he actually he like he he, he wrote a take down because we Mark Perlmutter and I wrote an article in Politico together. Uh, Mark is a Jewish American um, hand surgeon from North Carolina. Uh, he and I were were in Gaza together, and we became we became good friends since then. And even this guy the, at the foundation for the, 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 the this is just some crazy right wing thing. thing. I can't even remember what it's called. But the um, and the guy who was writing the thing was an imbecile. Like he didn't know anything about that. I, I, I corresponded with him by email for a while. He had, had just literally didn't know anything about the conflict he was purporting to talk about. But um, even even this guy just what you know he 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 pointed out that Mark. Uh, you know, he didn't give the context, but he said that Mark once posted something on Twitter saying Zionism is the moral equivalent of Nazism. Well, you know, Mark doesn't believe that, uh, but he uh, he wrote that after leaving the trauma bay. Uh, I, I wasn't there that I wasn't there at the moment. I was in Rafa. He left that after after leaving the trauma bay in an incident where I think 12 or 13 children came in with like total body surface burns. They're all screaming at the top of their heads. And you have to understand Mark's a Jewish fellow. His dad, you know, his dad is uh, or his, uh, you know, his dad was an older Jewish fellow than him, obviously. Uh, they're, they're really steeped in the memory of the Holocaust. And so when you're standing in a small room, the air is literally starting to burn your eyes. And you've just got children screaming in pain in front of you with their flesh falling off. Well, what else are you going to think about? And it seems that it seems like a you know. So he wrote he tw he tweeted this on the way back. 
furious, you know, just at, just unbelievably angry at what he had just seen. And this guy's like, oh, look, this guy's an untrustworthy source. But even he didn't accuse any but even this guy didn't accuse us of making it up. So I, I was surprised by that, actually. I, I you know, because I, I pretty much only interact with doctors and nurses in my life. And um, so I know I know I know they can make stuff up. But the uh, but nobody nobody has accused us of that. And I, I thought that was interesting. And, I, you know, I've been very careful because these are extreme things that we've that we've seen and. I want to make sure that I, and number one, I don't want to do what these crazy, you know, what are they called, Zaka or the, whoever these crazy people are that made up the stories about the beheaded babies and all those. Um, they, I, I don't want to go down that route and say, no, no, we can, we can make up a bunch of crazy. <laughs> there, there, the the crimes that are happening in Gaza are real enough. We don't need to exaggerate them, you know. So um, there was a woman. Uh, she's a pediatric nurse practitioner named Asma Taha. She was actually on that uh, podcast with me yesterday too. And uh, when I was writing the letter, uh, the first letter, the one in July, she, um, when she emailed me back saying, "Yeah, I'd like to sign." I couldn't believe it. Uh, again, she's a pediatric nurse practitioner, so she take, takes care of young children, kids who were just born. She said, I couldn't believe it every day. Um, and she's worked in Gaza many, many times uh, over the past 40 years um, or 30 years. I think she said 40 times in 30 years, something like that. Uh, but she said, every day I saw children come back to the hospital, meaning newborns come back to the hospital, uh, dead of dehydration and, and malnutrition every day that she was there for two weeks. And so I, I, I said, holy cow, because like, that's, 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 that's relatively new information. That's not widely reported. A, a few deaths from starvation-related causes have been reported, but they're not why. But that, that means she's seen, she personally saw more children die of starvation-related uh, causes than have been reported in the entire, at least English-speaking world. So I called her and I said, hey, Asma, look, I, please don't think I'm accusing you of anything, but I want to make absolutely sure so what you're saying is literally true. Like it's true exactly the way she said for us every single day, at least one, sometimes more. And I was, that's why I like in the, in the July letter, I put it at the very top of the, of the, of the letter, because it's just shocking information, you know? So it's, um, so yeah, anyway, beginning to the New York times, the, um, you know, the times, um, the Times opinion, uh, the, the, it, that, what that thing is called is it's called a visual opinion piece, uh, and they have a separate team or maybe more than one. I'm not sure, but they have a separate team that actually puts those things together. Now, I didn't realize that like the large majority of opinion pieces that are published in The New York Times are actually requested by The Times. Like they reach out to somebody and ask them because, you know, if you're like Bill Clinton or somebody, I'm sure you can just write a New York Times editorial and just send it to them in their opinion piece and they just publish it. But the uh, or maybe they probably go back and forth. But you know what I mean? Like they have that pull they can do that uh but for other for you know mere mere mortals um you if, if they they'll they'll reach out to you if they want one want one written and so the the visual editorial team reached out to me and i gotta tell you i i've i've almost everything i've ever written about the israel palestine conflict which is you know i don't have like independent academic expertise on it or something so um, it's not like I've, I've been published on like Counterpunch and Electronic Intifada before this. Not 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 like high uh, highbrow uh, highbrow media, but the um, but I uh, uh, almost everything I've written has actually been criticism of the New York Times specifically. Uh, so when you yeah you know, when they reached out to me, I said either they didn't Google me very effectively or they did and they actually want to know what I'm going to say. Um, so. Uh, we'll so yeah, so I, they, they said we would like. What's that, sir? We we will see if their reporting changes in light of the information. It, no, it won't. It won't. It had, I I wouldn't I wouldn't even plan on it. The the I have not changed anything about the institutional structure of the New York Times. I assure you. The um, but so they the the because you you got to remember the the the. And you, you've read you've read manufacturing consent. You you've uh, you know you know what this what these things are. Um, there's these institutions function in a certain way now if uh it may be and i don't i don't really know but it may be that a, a large group of physicians and nurses you know and physicians are pretty wealthy people were pretty well respected blah 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 so it might be that the new york times actually considers that a political area of influence and then maybe that maybe that will lead to um to coverage uh expanding to include the perspective that Israel is uh, is just slaughtering people in Gaza with our with our weapons, but but you know so 
So they reached out to me and they said, hey, look, this is the idea we have for an editorial. And I will say that I was, and, and I just want to be very clear, the, the, edit, the, the opinion, the, the visual opinion people that I worked with, uh, I, I won't name them just because I hadn't asked if I should or not, but I, I did, some of them have tweeted. But anyway, um, the, the people that I worked with were very serious and they were very uh, down to earth. And when they would, I, I established pretty quickly that I know the conflict better than they do. I, I know the conflict better than most people. Uh, acad from the academic work is what I'm talking like not I, I know it personally too obviously because I've been there but I'm talking about the academic work and the conflict so when I once they realized like I know something about it they would actually listen to me and they would say oh we didn't realize like one of the things was uh, uh, we I pointed out that if uh, if we stop sending Israel munitions then they'll stop using them and they said oh no but Israel has huge stores of American munitions and I said no they don't that's not true at all where would you hear that the um yeah it, the truth of the fact of the matter is the U.S. probably just doesn't trust Israel to give them years worth of stores. Um, so they have about 72 hours worth of munitions is what they're burning through all the, uh, now. That's why we send them two cargo containers or two cargo ships, excuse me, and a um, and uh, several air flights per week. So the uh, so, you know, so like so when they when they came up, when when information like that came up, they would defer to me and they'd say, OK, you know, thanks for telling us. We didn't actually realize that when I told them that the, the term Gazan is actually a little it's politically incorrect because it accepts Israel and the U.S.'s framework that Gaza and the West Bank should be divided. So it's better to just say Palestinians in Gaza. They're like, we did not realize that. And that's fair. Like, you know, they're not subject matter experts on this. How would they know that? So. Uh, so that was that, that that was interesting. When the piece got to the higher up editors, that's when people started interfering with it. Um, but you know, I think because I really and and to be fair, a lot of their suggestions, even though their suggestions were at first nonsensical, they led to the piece being better in the end, which is which was good. And that was largely because the visual editorial team would temper my rage. And um, and would say, well, you know, think about it for a minute. Is there a way to incorporate this criticism? And I think, oh, yeah, there is actually. Actually, one of them was one of them's kind of funny. I'm, I'm sure nobody can can pick it up other than me. I, I'm trying to remember now what the exact wording is, but um, the uh, there's a piece where or the, there's a paragraph where it says, uh, was this all? What was was this awful outcome? Or no, no, sorry. There's a, there's a paragraph where it starts to kind of list the outcomes that have happened for the Palestinians and for Israel since October 7th. This many dead, this, this you know, the uh, one toilet for every 4,000 people in the Mawasi area. But then it goes on to Israel and it says, you know, 1,400 Israelis total have been killed. And it's not the exact number, but, you know, and, um, uh, and then a, um, uh, the uh, Israeli media widely reports that uh, Netanyahu is constantly sabotaging ceasefire talks with both Hamas and Hezbollah but is uh, at, while escalating armed conflict deliberately. And so the higher up editor inserted, even though Hamas is no longer participating in negotiations. And I said, whoa, no, 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 that's, that's a completely, I mean, it's technically accurate. They're not because this, the last thing Israel did was murder the lead negotiator. So obviously they stopped participating in negotiations. That, that was a perfectly predictable outcome of blowing up Israel, Ismail Haniya in, uh, in Tehran. But the, um, so, so she's they, so the editor inserted this, and I said, no, like like without context, that just makes it look like Hamas is equally obstructionist to Israel. That's like if Hamas blew up the Israeli security cabinet, it's not like you would say like, well, since Israel has lost interest in negotiations, you'd, they'd be like, no, that's there's no context there. That's not an appropriate thing to say. So, so I said, no, we're not saying that, and. I was lucky because I don't actually care if I'm published in the New York Times. Like it doesn't do anything for my life, for my career. Uh, you know, I, I don't care. And so because of that, I was willing to say like, no, 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 look, if you're going to insist that that's written there, then I'm going to walk away from this piece. And the visual editorial folks had put a lot of time and effort into this. And so they fought for it. And, and to be fair, like we incorporated the criticism. Oh, but sorry, that was the point I forgot to say. So um, what what we ended up doing was saying I'm about uh, three minutes left and i really want to ask you about the letter so oh sorry go no no go for me it. like 
60 seconds at the end. Go for it. No, no, go for it. Ask, ask me anything. Go for it. <laughs> okay. We're, we're speaking with Feroz Sidwa, and we'll have links up on talkworldradio.org to the New York Times piece, which it's wonderful. You negotiated and got it in there because it, it reaches people, but also to this letter uh, signed by at least 100 doctors that makes a powerful case that the number of dead Palestinians in Gaza as a result of this war uh, is significantly higher uh, than what you will read every day in the New York Times and every other media outlet. Can you can you just talk for, for two minutes about that? Yeah, uh, the long and short of it is that the Ministry of Health in Gaza, its numbers are always presented as maybe this many Palestinians have died, right? The 42,000. That's a total misunderstanding of what they're reporting. The Ministry of Health is reporting confirmed cases of deaths by violence. That's it. They're not reporting at all on plenty of other causes of death that are being wildly exacerbated. And in this case, the major one is starvation. Because the, you know, if if someone starved to death in World War II in Germany when we invaded Germany, it'd be hard to say that that's a sensible thing to blame on the Allies because we weren't starving Germans on purpose. Israel is clearly starving Gaza on purpose. Nobody even pretends to dispute, you know, other than Israeli spokespeople and maybe American spokespeople, nobody disputes that. Um, so it makes sense to count the, the dead in uh, the from starvation. And if you look at that, again, just because of time, I won't go into the details, but if you look at the appendix to the letter, which is available at GazaHealthCareLetters.org, um, you can see how we did the calculations. It's using the integrated food security phase classifications data. And the lowest number, the minimum number of dead from starvation that we can come up with was, I think, 62,000. And that's how you, you if, if, if the, the, it's all laid out in the appendix very clearly. So a total of 118,000, but that's the minimum estimate that somebody can make with the available data. That's what I want to emphasize. It's probably much higher, actually. And even the ministry says they estimate 10,000 uh, dead under the rubble, dead from under the, the rubble, rubble yeah, island, exactly. but not yep. identified, no body in hand. Yeah. Uh, so already you're up from from 40,000 something to 50,000 something. Yeah, and, they, and they've been estimating 10,000 people buried under the rubble for six months. So Right. It has you know, to be more. It, it, and to be fair, it's a completely arbitrary number. They've just pulled it out of thin air. But, you know, again, I, I anybody who's seen what kind like I, I did drive through Khan Yunus, but even, and this is before it was actually completely destroyed. Um, it's just shocking that the level of destruction is insane. It looks like an atom bomb hit the place. I'm really, and I'm not exaggerating. It, it just, it's, it's incredible. See, it, it's very hard to figure. It's very hard to believe that there's only 10,000 bodies buried under the rubble, but nobody will ever know until it's counted and Israel won't let anyone go into count. So, well, we, it may be impossible ever to have a, a very exact figure, but I think the 118 is guaranteed closer to the truth than 40,000. Um, we've been yeah. speaking with Feroz Sidwa. I wish we could go another hour but we're out of minutes uh i will have uh links up to his work at talkworldradio.org feroz thank you for everything you're doing and for coming on talk world radio no thank you i appreciate it this is talk world radio i'm david swanson take action at rootsaction.org help end war at worldbeyondwar.org Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.